Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the country, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Ask an Expert webinar, Three Reasons to Use the MBTI Assessment. My name is Michael Segovia, and I will be facilitating this webinar for us over this next hour or so. I do want to point out that we will be sending out the link to this webinar along with slides for you all to have following this webinar. And we're not gonna be using the chat feature. Instead, we'll be using the questions feature where you can then go in and enter any comments and questions. And we are gonna have time in this webinar to hear from you. So please feel free to send any questions our way. We did receive several questions from a number of people before this webinar. So of course, I'll start by addressing those just a little bit later. Now, a little bit more about who I am. My name is Michael Segovia. I am a senior consultant with the Myers-Briggs Company. I'll be celebrating my 33rd anniversary this coming May, next month, well, next month, 33 years. I am certification faculty for the assessments that we provide certification on. My background is in clinical psychology with a specialization in assessment, administration, and interpretation. And just by chance, I took a certification program on how to deliver programs virtually about four years ago. And we all know because of the pandemic, that's pretty much what has been happening ever since lots of virtual delivery. So feel free to ask questions related to that if you'd like as well. Here's our agenda. So we're gonna start briefly with what is the MBTI assessment? And we even wanna hear from you, what do you think the MBTI assessment is or how might it be used? and we'll do a poll related to that. I'm gonna then address the three reasons you might want to use the MBTI assessment based on comments we've received from a previous webinar, and then of course, time to answer questions. So to kick things off, why don't we start with a poll? And the poll is, what is your relationship with the MBTI assessment? And I'm gonna just make sure that poll is open there. So I'll start filling in, please. Uh, answers like, I'm an MBTI practitioner and I use it often, or I've received MBTI feedback, but I'm not, and let me bring my mouse up here, not certified, I think, or trained is what that's gonna say. If I could get a little bit bigger for me to see, or I have heard of the MBTI, but have not completed it. And maybe there's a question, what is the MBTI? I've never even heard of it before, which happens every now and then, not often, however, every now and then. And we'll give it some time. We see so far the majority of people in our webinar today are MBTI, MBTI practitioners and use it often. So it's a great way for us to learn together by coming together for this webinar. A few people have not been trained on it so far. Some people have not completed it, and we're just going to, all right, that poll is closed. So yeah, so you can just go to the polls feature. If you open that up, you can then see yeah, most people in this webinar are practitioners, probably people who have been to other webinars offered by the Myers-Briggs company. So we do provide several webinars throughout our year, throughout each year. Thanks for answering that first question, everybody. And speaking of webinars, you will find on our website, and we'll send you links to several of these other webinars. We do have one on what is the MBTI assessment. My colleague, John Hexton has done a really good one there. What is the MBTI used for? We're gonna address some of that, of course, just a bit. However, we do have content on our website there and who uses the MBTI assessment. I did a webinar on what is MBTI certification. I think it was, I'm not great with time, maybe a month or two or three ago. And again, we'll send you links to these various webinars that we have. I was on our website just a bit ago and I'm amazed at all the content that is there available free for people to access by going to the resources section and looking at the webinars as well. And we have many, many resources available to you. Those of you who are practitioners, those of you who are interested in becoming practitioners as well. So we did get a number of questions before we arrived, and one of them relates to what kind of team issues can the MBTI framework help resolve? And just to get sort of a pulse around our group here in this webinar, we'd like to hear from you. What issues does your team need to work on the most? And this is another poll, 
and I can see it coming up in on screen now, communication challenges, managing change, and leadership development, which is really, these are the areas I'm gonna be focusing on in our webinar today, what comes up. And I'm not surprised, by the way, what I'm seeing so far, where you can see about half and half for communication and leadership with managing change, sort of coming in a little bit, and now we're seeing, it's almost like a horse race, with communication in the lead, followed by leadership. I don't know horse race terms, however, you probably know that analogy. And we'll maybe give it a few more seconds. I see 75% of people have voted. We have 137 people in our webinar today, and that's a nice group of people, by the way. And maybe give it a few more seconds, and we'll see some final answers. By the way, while, while we are waiting for that poll to close, there are a number of resources you have available to you. I'm gonna bring up some of them that are available on our website that you can also purchase. Uh, one of my favorites is the introduction to Myers-Briggs type booklet. And I tend to keep one relatively close. Here's a copy of that booklet where you'll find lots of good application uses of the MBTI. And I use this booklet every time I give feedback for anyone at all. It just gives me a really good framework and a good reminder when people walk away from a feedback or group session what it is they want to continue to explore. And you can see for our group, if you've opened up the polls tab, 43% communication, and then we're seeing 24% managing change and 33% for leadership development. And I'm personally, I'm not surprised to see communication as the top percentage getter because communication tends to be that umbrella that overlays how we manage change and how we develop in terms of leaders and maybe how we deal with conflict and how we deal with decision making. It's often communication as that umbrella. So just a brief, and I know most of us already know a lot about the Myers-Briggs type indicator, just a brief overview just so that we're all on the same page. Starting with extroversion and introversion, where do you get your energy? And it's not about being shy, not about being loud or quiet, it's about where do we get our energy? For sensing and intuition, what kind of information do you prefer to, to use? What, do you, what kind of information do you trust? For thinking and feeling, what process do you use to make decisions? And for judging and perceiving, how do you deal with the world around you? How do you organize your external world. And again, the booklet I showed a moment ago, Introduction to Myers-Briggs Type, you can see really good definitions for each of the preference pairs, starting on page five, where you'll see ENI and SNN, and then page six, TNF and JMP. And I'll address, of course, these preference pairs and combinations of them as we move through our webinar today, as it relates to communication, managing change, and leadership development. So in terms of issues that the MBTI framework can help solve, now, of course, the MBTI will not solve every single issue that every single person is dealing with. It, though, can give us some understanding around what challenges we have when we communicate with people who are different from us, how we might manage change, and what might sort of be a motivator for people when they're dealing through, with change, and what might be a bit of a, a challenge or a stretch for people when they're dealing with change. And in terms of leadership, recognizing, of course, all of us can be amazing leaders. However, the best leaders are those who know how to flex to the needs of their followers. And flexing means understanding your own preferences and understanding the preferences of the people who you lead and flexing to those, to those differences. And of course, I'll share some brief information related to all of this as we move through this webinar. Let's start with productive communication. And I've taken some content from the book that we have titled Introduction to Myers-Briggs Type of Communication by Donna Dunning. And you can find this resource on our website. I would recommend taking a look at this where you can see, for example, at the very top, extroversion and introversion, where we find people who prefer extroversion, when they communicate, they need an opportunity to talk things over. And when we don't give them that opportunity, it might be hard for them to know what it is they know. What is it I often say, People who prefer extroversion often don't know what they're thinking or feeling until they hear themselves say it. 
versus over those over on the side for introversion, they need time to think about it. They need to be a bit more reflective, maybe even a bit more in this place of internal understanding before they're ready to speak or talk about what it is they want to talk about. And so right off the bat, you can see where there could be communication challenges when you have people of the opposite preferences here, where somebody who prefers extroversion might overwhelm people who prefer introversion, and people who prefer introversion might underwhelm people who prefer extroversion. So it really does go back to how do we flex to meet the needs of the people that we're working with, the people that we're communicating with. I like to think of instead of maybe the golden rule, which is communicate or treat people how you want to be treated, instead consider the platinum rule, which is really about communicating or treating people the way they need to be, they need to be communicated to and or with. We can look at sensing and intuition where we find people who prefer sensing need just the facts and just those facts. So when we overwhelm them with big picture possibilities, and I know for me, I get on my magic carpet and I go off on this amazing journey, but I'm not on the ground with those details for people who prefer sensing. I'm not communicating with them the way they need to be communicated with. Versus over on the intuition side, I can see it all now. That is my preference. And I know for me, it's about big picture possibilities. And so if you start to overwhelm me with lots of details, lots of facts, lots of specifics. I'm gonna try to remember some of those, but to be honest, I actually won't. So start big picture for me and for those of us who prefer intuition. And if we need more detail, we'll ask for it. We can see when it comes to productive communication, thinking and feeling for those who prefer thinking when they're communicating a decision, they do it in a logical, objective, task-focused way. And they need to do that. And the advantage there is we know what they're thinking when they're making that decision. The disadvantage there is for those people who prefer thinking is they might not consider the impact of the people involved in that decision. And then we can see on the feeling side, will anyone be hurt? And that is my preference as well. And what happens there for those of us who prefer feeling, many of us know the MBTI well is we make decisions based on our values and how those decisions impact people. As a result, it might mean that we tend to soften our message. I know I do that. I soften my decision a little too much. And so as a result, people wonder, what is Michael really saying here? And then finally, judging and perceiving. On the judging side, it's about doing something. It's about coming to closure. And that's a big part of what people who prefer judging need to do. They need to come to closure, to check things off their list, now, the challenge there when they're communicating is they might check or close things off their list in that communication too soon versus over on the perceiving side. Let's wait and see. There's where we find those who prefer perceiving needing to keep their options open to keep taking in more information. However, the challenge there is they might keep their options open too long and as a result might not make that decision at all. So what I'm trying to get across when it comes to preferences and on this slide, we're looking at communication. All of our preferences can help us and all of our preferences can be challenges. So the question that comes to me from my mentor, Linda Kirby, is whenever we're talking about our preferences or helping somebody explore their preferences, ask questions like, so in terms of communication, how does this preference help you and how might it not? How does this preference help you and how might it not? By the way, speaking of Linda Kirby, and I would bring in Nancy Barger, they are the authors of Introduction to Myers-Briggs Type and Change, where we can now, instead of just looking at the preference pairs, start to look at different combinations, where we have introversion and sensing. We call these people the thoughtful realists, where basically they need time to reflect, to understand the details involved. And during change, if they're not given that time, there's where you might find them resisting that change. We get to extroversion and sensing. We call these people the action-oriented realists, where they need time to discuss, to understand the details involved. They need to be able to talk to other people instead of just being in their own silo, if you will. So you can imagine how something like dis uh, social distancing and this pandemic might affect people who prefer extroversion and sensing, who might not have as many opportunities to discuss, to understand the details that are involved.
We get to introversion and intuition. We call these people the thoughtful innovators where they need time to reflect, to understand the big picture goal. Uh, I'm in this quadrant of the type table, the upper right-hand quadrant of the type table, and I can engage in brainstorming meetings, However, I first need that time to understand what it is I know before I'm ready then to engage in those meetings. So often for me, my best content comes the next day where, oh, now that I've thought about it, here are all these other great things I can bring up if you give me that time. And then finally, we get to extroversion and intuition, the action-oriented innovators who need time to discuss to understand that big picture goal needing to explore ideas and possibilities with other people. The more they get that opportunity, the more then they understand what it is they know. And by the way, I'm referencing these resources. You can see again, Introduction to Myers-Briggs Type and Change. These are just small excerpts or small pieces from these different resources. I hope you'll check these out, of course. And then Leadership Development. And this resource is Introduction to Myers-Briggs Type. Uh, and the Introduction to Myers-Briggs Type and Leadership booklet by Sharon Richmond is the author of the Leadership booklet. And Sharon Richmond and I are big fans of Stanford women's basketball. They're in the Final Four. If anybody's interested in that, you would be excited as well. I think Connecticut's there as well. South Carolina and Louisville are the Final Four women's basketball contenders. So your team hopefully is in there also. Off topic, sorry, there's my intuition taking over. Moving back to leadership development where we see thinking and judging. We call these people the logical decision makers who, when it comes to making a decision, need to be able to come to that closure and they make a decision in a clear, concise, objective, task-focused way. That's what you get from these leaders. And here's where it can be a challenge if let's say they lead people who prefer me, feeling and perceiving. Who are, you can look at the very bottom of this bullet list, the values-based decision makers who make decisions based on what are the, this inner, what's this inner core of values that we live by, that guides us, that leads us. And it can be a challenge for us when we have a leader who is opposite of us. I can think of a leader in my life who has thinking and judging preferences and who is amazing at leading me because she really knows how to flex to what I need as a person who, who is somebody who reports directly under her. A great leader, and again, the best leaders are those who know how to flex to the needs of their followers. I'm skipping around on the slide, I know. We can go to the second bullet where we see thinking and perceiving the adaptable problem solvers, who also make decisions in that objective, task-focused way. However, they need to keep their options open just a bit before they're ready to make a decision. And that can be a challenge for them, let's say, if the people who report to them prefer feeling and judging, who like that supportive coach, but also want that person to come to closure for them. And that leader who prefers thinking and perceiving might not do that soon enough for that person who prefers feeling and judging, who like this supportive coach, who that, that person who prefers feeling and judging when they lead, they like to lead that way by being there for you to provide support, to be that person who, when you have an issue to come and talk to you about those issues. And again, that might be a challenge if they're working with somebody opposite of them, because that supportive coach wants to support you by also helping you come to closure. And if you're not ready to come to closure, that might be too much. It might be putting you into a situation that you're not ready to make a decision on. And again, you can read all about or a lot more about any of this in the introduction to Myers-Briggs Type and Leadership. So that's an overview of all of this. What I wanna do is move forward because I know that was fast and I wanna make sure we leave time for your questions related to any of this. And of course, to any other questions that come up for you as we're going through any of this content. Before we do that though, I'm gonna hand it over to Jen, who is gonna just share some information related to what's next in all of this. Thanks, Michael. If you could go to the next slide. I um, just wanted to say thank you for sharing what the value of the MBTI assessment can bring to your personal and professional development. If you're interested in getting MBTI certified, we will be sending out more information about the upcoming program dates you can sign up for. We will also be sending this recording along with the slides. If you're already MBTI certified, don't forget about our MBTI referral program. Okay, so now let's jump into answering your questions. Thanks, Jan, very much. 
Okay, so let's see. Um, is COVID enough of a traumatic event to sway someone from T to F? A little more background mm -hmm. on this question. Um, an METI practitioner was recently administered um, a small group of male engineers, three of five of them came out as feeling, having a preference for feeling. She found this odd and was wondering if being at home for almost two years around the family may have swayed them to be slightly F instead of their typical thinking preference. Interesting. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Mary, for that question. You know, we do have data that shows people who prefer thinking or engineers tend to be attracted to or have a preference for thinking. However, that doesn't mean engineers can't have a preference for feeling because every type is represented in every career. And so one option could be maybe she just had a group of people who prefer feeling who also happen to be engineers. That said, and I do have an answer on screen as well, according to the theory from Jung and from Myers and Briggs, our preferences actually don't change, but how we use or express our preferences can change. In fact, maybe they even should change as we develop and grow, as we move through midlife into the second half of life, where we've taken in what we've learned from the first half and learned to use the opposite side in that second half of life. Now, possible factors that can create this change, you can see on screen, environmental influences, and we have lived with them all of our life and we live with them now. Maybe job expectations, or maybe relationships that you've been in or relationships you're in now. And of course, life-changing events like, like COVID can very much influence then how we express our preferences and then maybe how we sit down and, and answer questions on an assessment. One option I would like people to consider is to take a look at their MBTI step two facets and to see are there any out of preference facet results showing up. And dir taken directly from the manual, the step two gives us diversity in the expression of our type where you could have somebody who prefers thinking and they have many facets over on the feeling side that show how they maybe have changed the expression of their type based on the environment that or the influences of their environment or you could have somebody who prefers feeling and they might have facets on the thinking side or maybe in the mid zone and by the way, if you're not familiar with the MBTI Step 2, I would recommend go to our website and just do a search for the MBTI Step 2. It will give you information about your preferences as well as five facets or five interesting ways to understand each of those preference pairs. Not every way to describe each preference pair, just five, some five ways to understand each of the preference pairs. If anybody needs further information related to any of this, please put your question in chat and we'll do our best to answer. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, the next question from Rose is, how is valid validity and reliability of the instrument determined? Good question, Rose, thank you for that. And it's a big question and it's one we cover in the MBTI certification program. Whether you're doing this in person, there's a full section on it or if you're doing this through our virtual program there's a lot of work in the online learning that you have to do to complete that certification and then we have a component at the end of that program where then we put you into breakouts and you talk about the difference between reliability and validity and how is it determined i think a great place to start looking at that information for anyone is to go to the mbti manual and this is the newest mbti manual published the end of 2000 18, where you will find it's the global step one and step two assessment. And you'll see for reliability, reliability, by the way, equals consistency of results, or you'll see both internal and test retest reliability. And the data is actually really good. Is it perfect? No. And guess what? No assessment is perfect. You'll also see information around validity, which is, does the assessment do what we say it does? where you'll see information related to construct and criterion validity, and it's all collected by our research division, peer-reviewed, of course, and continually updated as we continually collect more data. Data is a big part of what we do uh, from our research division to make sure that the assessment is consistent and that it does what we say it does. We also have on our website a, an MBTI facts page 
that covers reliability and validity, as well as all these other questions that might come up related to the MBTI assessment. All right, let's go to our next one here. Go ahead, Jen. As an MBTI certified practitioner, how do you respond to untrue press and media about the MBTI assessment? I will say how I honestly respond is it hurts my heart is how I'll honestly respond because what you often get are comments from people who are educated maybe in their own field, but not really educated on the MBTI assessment. And so I always want to talk to those people and just share what is the MBTI really all about? It's about our preferences. It's not about skill or ability. It's not about putting you into a box, even though you see a 16 room house with a bunch of boxes. Maybe think about that as a 16 room house with a bunch of rooms, where we're asking you to identify which room do you prefer while also recognizing, of course, you use all of those rooms in that 16 room house, not just one of those rooms. And so we do have some good content that you can find again free on our website. One of them is titled Creating Clarity, Addressing Misconceptions About the MBTI Assessment. It's a white paper by a colleague and somebody that I respect quite a bit. His name is Patrick Kerwin, who did a quite a bit of research around the criticism of the MBTI. And a lot of it relates to an old, old study way back from the 1970s that people keep citing as current data. And that's three forms ago. That was form G of the MBTI. We've moved on from that from, from to form M. And now we're on the global version where you'll see some really good data there. And we also have, by the way, on our website, a free resource titled MBTI and how to respond to inaccurate press and media. And you're gonna see a lot out there because the MBTI is the most widely known personality assessment in the world. As a result, it's often a way for people to maybe make a name for themselves by criticizing it. However, I think if you really looked at that critique, you'll see a lot, uh, several flaws and maybe even, I'm just gonna say it, some self-serving comments from people who are critiquing. So yeah, it does, it hurts my heart because we are a publishing company who works really hard to make sure we put out an assessment that can make this lifelong difference in people's lives. All right, I, if you have more comments, questions related to that specific critique, put them in your questions and I'll, I'll be sure to address those. Go ahead, Jen. Is it better to have a team with the same MBTI preferences or does a team with differing MBTI preferences create more conflict? And, you know, I think it's a really interesting question to think about. And I want to start off by first making it really clear. We never, ever, ever would use the MBTI for selection. Selection in that I'm going to hire everybody with the same type or hire people of different types because the MBTI won't tell us how well or not well we do a job. So it's never used there. That said, when we look at teams that are alike and teams that are not noticing the first bullet on screen, teams that were more often alike come to closure sooner, but end up taking in information and making decisions with a few gaps along the way. So imagine if you have a team where everybody prefers thinking, they're making decisions with that objective task-focused approach. And what tends to happen is the people who are impacted by those decisions realize you didn't consider us enough. You didn't consider how it impacts us. I remember doing work with a team. This was uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and we were doing type in decision making, where I have a team first start with answering questions related to a problem they're working on, focusing on sensing, and then focus on intuition. Then I move to thinking. And when it was time for that team to move to feeling, I remember team members said to me, no, 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 we need more time to talk about thinking. It's most important to us. And I said to them, and that's probably your problem. You're spending so much time making decisions based on thinking, not enough time making decisions considering the feeling side of it as a feeling side of it as well. So we do see this second bullet on screen. And this is this really comes to us from Isabel Briggs Myers, where she found that organizations and teams that encourage diverse points of view are at an advantage over those that do not. Now it might take them longer to get to that closure. However, when they stay open to those differences, when they stay open to understanding that how I take in information versus how you take in information can be really valuable when we bring it together, 
it's not just twice as good, it's actually 10 times as good. I can think of a colleague I worked with years ago when she joined the company. At first, we didn't get along, and we started to look at our preference differences, and as a result of that, we actually became best friends in the company, and we learned to rely on each other, where, again, our work wasn't just twice as good. It was 10, 20 times better because we were able to bring our differences together and understand them more effectively. And then when we worked together, we would bring in so what would Janet think about in this situation? And she would think, what would Michael think about in this situation so that we could then incorporate those differences into how we take in information and how we make decisions without the other person around? All right, go ahead, Jen, please. How should I determine how to answer the questions in the METI assessment? Should I answer as if I'm at work, at home, or with friends? How should I pick? You know, it's a good question, and it's one we cover quite a bit in the MBTI certification program, and it relates to mindset. What frame of mind should you be in when you answer questions on the MBTI? What frame of mind should you be in? We actually don't want you to think about work or home or a relationship you're in. Instead, the language I use, and I've, I've Put it right here on this slide. We want you to remove any roles and expectations from both work and home and just answer how you prefer as if you have nothing and no one to answer to. That's the frame of mind we want you to be in when you're answering questions on the MBTI. It's sometimes why when people take a look at their MBTI results, they say, I don't know if this fits me. It could be because they weren't able to take off all the hats they wear and answer just according to who they are outside of the roles they play in work and home and in other parts of their life. Now, I will say it's virtually impossible to take off all of those roles and expectations. However, however, the more you can do that, the more likely your results will be consistent and true for you. So do think about when you invite people, we have a number of people who are MBTI practitioners, think of this language, removing roles and expectations and just answer, as if you have nothing and no one to answer to. All right, so let's just open it up for what other questions that might have come in. I am very curious to hear what we have from anybody at all. Go ahead, Jen, please. <clears throat> yes, okay, so Connie asks, is there a webinar on a refresher for practitioners? Is there a webinar on refresher for practitioners? Uh, Jen, I did one about three years ago, like an overview on type. I know John Haxton did one as well recently on, here's an overview of, of what the MBTI is. And we have a really good webinar on the global version of the MBTI, because you know it was revised and we started doing training on that just three years ago. So what are the changes? And so we have a webinar on that. We can maybe include that link in uh, our follow-up information to you. Just a quick overview on the revision of the MBTI. You might remember from Form M, we had a representative sample of 3,009 in the US and about a little less than 2,000 in the UK. Now we have a global sample of 17,773 that is representative, except for, I think in Brazil, that's more of a sample of convenience. And of course, we have samples of much larger than that in the millions. We're just looking at representative data in that revision. And in that revision, we used something called latent, latent class analysis or LCA for the scoring of the step one results, which basically assumes that we all belong to one group or another, which is really the dichotomous or psychological opposite nature of the Myers-Briggs Myers -Briggs type indicator. Yes, and we also do have the refresher course, um, so we can also send out more information on that after after this presentation. That's true. There is a refresher course that is available for purchase, and that refresher course is uh, of me delivering an in-person certification program, and we've taken excerpts from that, that that is available on our website for purchase. Thanks for that reminder, Jen. I did it. You'd think I'd remember it. <laughs> Okay, so next question. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. <laughs> Hold on. Jen is a trooper. She's dealing with, she's not feeling well and she's still here for us. So we really appreciate you, Jen, being here. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Okay, so Celia asks, 
She, ha she has introduced a senior executive team to MBTI basics. The model type, the modal type for the team is ESTJ slash P. What can we do next now that they have had a couple of months to think about it? They are very senior people and getting their time and attention is difficult. So she wants to make the most of our next section, next session. Uh, you know, it's a good question. And how do you keep this moving forward? And that's, I think, where the real power of all of this is. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you just go in and talk about whatever for an hour or four hours or even a day, you need to keep that moving forward to keep that learning moving forward. So I would maybe consider some one-on-one -on -one time with each person if you have the bandwidth for that. I can think of a team I worked with where we started with a team session where we learned about our preferences from a general perspective and from each other as well. And then I like to follow that up with individual work with each person to help them understand their type. And what you could do here is move into type dynamics to, to help them understand what is their favorite process and how is that supported by their second favorite? And what might they start to look like under initial stress, which we tend to overuse our favorite process. And then what we might start to look like under extreme stress where our fourth our inferior might take over and then give them some strategies to help them through that. That's a great way to use this one-on-one -on -one before then maybe you bring them back together to do some decision-making work, to do some work related to leadership if you haven't gotten there yet. And guess what? You can move it forward now and maybe bring in the MBTI step two as well for individual and for group work. Hopefully that was enough information. I could go on, by the way, all day related to that because it's an something I do quite a bit where I do ongoing work with groups of people and with individuals. Okay, next question. How do you deal with people who get defensive talking about the personality, especially friends or family who could benefit? Thank you, Becky, for your question. You know, Becky, I was in a relationship with someone like this for about 15 years. And when he would bring up comments or problems about work, I would say, well, maybe it's about, and it wasn't something he was even open to exploring until I remember one day he was complaining about those people in marketing who have all these big picture ideas and there's no reality behind those ideas. So right away in my mind, I'm thinking perhaps he has a preference for sensing. I don't know because we can't definitively know until they take the assessment and they verify, but it sounds like somebody who prefers sensing who wants more of a realistic approach. And so I said to him, here's how you might want to then follow up when, the, when those comments come up, when the marketing department has all these big picture ideas, here's some questions you can ask them so that you get the information that you need. So he went into a meeting the next day, asked those questions, was able to get more answers, and then came home to me and said, how did you know? And I said, it's all about, or a lot of it is about that MBTI assessment that I've been talking to you about for many, many years. And then he became interested. So often when people are become interested, it's they need to come to an aha moment. We can't keep pushing and pushing. Just give them some ideas to explore about type, and then maybe they'll come back and they'll be open to it. We always need to remember with the MBTI, it should always be completely voluntary, where the person decides whether or not they want to take it and whether or not they want to share any of their results about it. And it should always, of course, be completely confidential, where only the person who took the assessment has the right to share their results and to let you know whether it's okay if you share the results uh, further as well. So hopefully that helped. Feel free to add in another question if I can clarify further. Jen, what else do you have? Constance asks, curious if any of the other practitioners use the strong interest inventory with MBTI. So if you're a practitioner, an MBTI practitioner, go ahead and put in the chat if you also use the strong but Michael, could you let us know how you can incorporate your learnings with Strong in MBTI? You bet. Thanks, Jen, and thanks for that question as well. Constance, I believe, it sent us that question in. And I like to use the Strong whenever I'm doing any career work. In fact, I don't like to use the Myers-Briggs by itself if I'm doing any work around exploring careers with people. So the Strong Interest Inventory gives you information about your vocational interests, and it categorizes them uh, when we can look at first the general occupational themes, and we all have themes related to realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. My theme is artistic and social. 
maybe enterprising, but I would say for the most part, artistic and social. Then under that umbrella of the RIASEC, R-I-A-S-E-C, we have 30 basic interest scales. And you'll see on your strong interest inventory report, your top basic interest scales. And then we have a number of occupations under the occupational scales that basically look at your likes and dislikes and how they compare to people who have been in these various occupations for at least three years, who say that they are happy in that work and that they plan to stay in that work. So basically you're being compared to people who are in these various areas. And then we also look at what are called the personal style scales. So you can see how looking at your vocational interests and combining that with your predispositions in terms of your preferences can be a really powerful way to help somebody understand further who they are and what do they want to do with who they are. So I would recommend to always bring the strong interest inventory into any career, career work that you do. And it, what did we get from responses, Jen? Did a number of people say they used the strong? I do not believe that people have people have not entered um, if they have or not, but maybe they're just too shy. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'd be very curious. Again, if you do any career work, always bring the strong interest inventory into the mix. You need to be certified on that assessment, by the way, as well. Ooh, we what do have questions? a couple people that just put in the chat. Good. We do use the strong. Nice to hear. Good. And we have some really good content on our website. Uh, some excellent, a uh, few excellent webinars, some by Judith Gruder, who was my mentor on the strong, who has passed away. However, her voice is still with us. If you go to our webinars and you'll see her amazing knowledge, easily the person I believe who knew the most about the practical application of the strong. Judith Gruter, G-R-U-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E Here's a really interesting question. Are there any short sound bites, games, or icebreakers to keep MBTI alive day to day with the team? I know there's an app, but really looking for more of a resource for, for quick short activities. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. Deborah, that's a good question. And, and right away I think of, of course, we do have the app. So that's one place you can go. And I think what you could do is just break up, instead of doing a full four-day work, four-hour workshop, four, four days is the certification program, a four-hour workshop, maybe just bring people together to cover just some EI splitting learning tasks. So an EI, extroversion, introversion, splitting learning task could be, what does an ideal meeting look like for everybody? And just have that to start a meeting and then run the meeting to see how people are getting what they need. Or for sensing and intuition, you could just a great icebreaker there. Again, once people have taken the assessment and then you want to help them explore their preferences, have people just describe an apple. Use a few words and phrases to describe an apple. Or this comes to me from Judy Gruder, who I just mentioned a moment ago. What is time? You get really interesting responses when you have people who prefer sensing and people who prefer intuition. For thinking and feeling, you could be the manager of a little league softball team and you've made the playoffs and only 10 of you can go and you have 20 people on your team. How do you decide? That's a good one. You can try. And for judging and proceeding, plan an event and let's just see how people plan an event. By the way, we do these in the certification program and we get to see how you would run these kinds of learning tasks and the kinds of responses you get from people who are like you and people who are opposite you. We do these and of course others in, in our certification training. Thanks, Michael. We also have the MUTI playbook that covers a lot of oh, yeah. different um, MUTI activities that, that are really helpful. So we'll also send that out. Great, thank you. Yeah, so it's a newer resource that we have and definitely take a look at that playbook. Okay, next question from Lorraine. Can Michael, can you tell us a little more on the four-day workshop on activities? Yeah, thank you, Lorraine, for that. So the four-day certification program is what we offer for uh, those who want to get certified on the Myers-Briggs type indicator. By the way, for the Strong, our program is a two-day program. For the Myers-Briggs, it's four days. And throughout that certification, first I would, uh, I would recommend looking at our webinar where I give an overview of that program. However, for us here now, you learn a lot about the theory around the assessment. You learn a lot about the psychometrics. However, 
it's primarily a way to see when you get certified, how would you apply this and with this uh, assessment with teams and work groups? How would, how would you do this one-on-one -on -one with another person? So you get to actually practice that in a pair or trio. Also, we show you how would you use this in leadership and I even cover things like decision making and so on. And we do that all through activities. Now, because we've been doing this virtually, we do those in breakouts. If you were doing this in person, you would just have people at their tables break out and they would do these activities or learning tasks there. And so in our certification, we show you, here's how you're doing it virtually. Here's how you would modify this if you were doing this in person. And we have a number of them that we apply. And as Jen said, we also have the playbook that we'll make sure we send out to people as well. Okay, so we only have time for one more question. The last wow. question will be from Becky. How do you incorporate the use of the MBTI with remote teams, especially if they work asynchronously? You know, Becky, it's a really good question and it's a challenge we've taken on. I remember March of 2020, we came together and realized this is what's happening. And so we came together to figure out ways to deliver programs virtually. And you'll even see on our website, we have a number of, a couple of webinars on how would you engage people virtually. So I would go there definitely. Uh, some things to think about. And I always, for example, you notice in our live webinar here, I like to always be on camera. Now, for those who are seeing this in a recording, you won't see me on camera. However, one thing I would recommend is be on camera so you can look into people's eyes and they can see that you are a real person. That's one way to engage people. Another way is breakouts. And so you need a platform that lets you do that and you need to be comfortable with that platform where people get to go into their own groups and engage with each other so they're not just hearing you like this, you're hearing me this whole time, I would recommend going into breakouts where you get to engage with each other. And then when you come back from those breakouts, make sure you have, when you're in the breakout, a recorder, somebody who's writing down what is being said, and a reporter, somebody who's gonna share what's being said. So go to our website first though, you'll find some really good resources. I did one, I think maybe in May of 2020, and I think my, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rachel, Rachel Kubas Wilkinson, she did another one that's really, really good as well. They're free on our website. So I think, yeah, Jen, you said our time is, it's already 47 minutes after the hour. Time does fly. We would love to keep hearing from you though and let us know what other webinars would be useful for you to have us run. What other things would you wanna learn from us and maybe what we could learn from you and we'll put some content together, together based on that. I wanna thank you for this time. You can see our website is www.themyersbriggs.com. We have lots of great resources available to you. As Jen mentioned, we are gonna be sending out a number of resources to all of you who have attended this webinar. So thank you very, very much for being here with us. Jen, anything you'd like to say to close? No, that's it. Um, if you sent in a question and we didn't answer it today, we'll get back to you later this week. But thank you so much, Michael, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. Have a great rest of your week and we'll be in touch soon. Bye everybody.